house in my family home where I am very, very grateful to be woo, knocking over music stands for one <laughs> and just sheltering in place and quarantining with my parents and my sister and Noah and both dogs. And we have our Christmas tree behind us. We decorated it last night. There was a Twitter thread that went viral this week. I don't know if any of you saw it of a young Canadian Muslim man who was observing Christmas up close for the first time. And he made a number of very funny observations <laughs> that if you haven't read it, you should do a little search for it. But one of them is that there are, in his observation of his roommate's Christmas, there's filler ornaments, things you just kind of buy from the store to fill out your tree. And then there's keeper ornaments, the ones that are more precious to your family that kind of get passed down through the generations. And I'm sure at one time my family had filler ornaments, but at this point it is all keepers. Although we have a different distinction. We have front ornaments and back of tree ornaments. <laughs> so if I were to give you a little tour of our tree, the back would be covered in all the, all the ones that we don't want up front. But I, I love decorating the tree and I feel so grateful to be here on Christmas Eve this year. Normally, I don't get to be near all these family ornaments because I'm far away. And so that's an unexpected blessing for me. And in addition to all these great ornaments, there's also the family nativity set that we have. It's from Nogales, Mexico. And it's been part of our Christmas decorations for as long as I can remember. I wanna show you some of the pieces cause they're just beautiful. There's these wise men, although technically they shouldn't be in the nativity set. They should be somewhere on the other side of the living room because the Magi haven't gotten to baby Jesus yet. If you want to be technical about it. And we've got Joseph and Mary and little Jesus in the cradle. And then one of my favorites, the the sheep. I loved setting this up when I was a kid. I would always want to be the one who, who set up the nativity set because it felt like this way to participate in the story. It was this special job and I would just sit and look at them and imagine what all of them must be feeling. It felt very holy. And I'm sure that many of us have nativity sets or crushes. They adorn our apartments and homes, our churches, sometimes even our lawns. And they reflect what's told to us in the story, in the Bible, some of which we heard Pastor Veronica read for us this evening. So the gospel tells us that, you know, Mary and Joseph travel to the town of Bethlehem so that they can be registered for the census. And of course they can't find a place to stay, right? So they camp out in a stable where Mary gives birth to Jesus. And nearby there are our shepherds who are informed by the angel about the birth. And so they travel and then they too pay homage along with the other animals, sheep and cows. And if you saw the front of our bulletin, there's a really fantastic rendering of this that also includes flamingos and lions. It's from an artist, I believe from Kenya. It's a beautiful image, this nativity set. The animals and humans all together in adoration of little baby Jesus. But this image, as beautiful as it is, doesn't capture it all. It doesn't capture everything. Scripture doesn't even capture everything about that night so many years ago. 
For instance, it doesn't tell us what it was like for Mary and Joseph to travel while she was pregnant. Did her ankles swell up? Did Joseph get worried about the health of mother and baby? It doesn't tell us when Mary's water broke or whether she was scared to give birth. She was young, a first time mother. Was she nervous? It doesn't tell us when she began to push or whether she screamed out in pain. And we don't even know what their surroundings were really like. Were there actually animals? Straw? Was it more like a cave? That's what some commentators and traditions of Christianity believe that it was more sort of a cave rock formation. Some say that really what we translate as stable was actually just kind of like a main room of the house. We don't know if other extended family members were gathered around. We don't know if Joseph held Mary's hand in her labor. Scripture doesn't tell us about Jesus's borning cry or how it felt for Mary to hold her baby for the very first time. We don't know if Mary struggled to get Jesus to latch for his first feeding. We don't know how Joseph calmed Jesus when he got fussy. The nativity said it's so beautiful. I love it, but it's not the whole picture. This is almost sort of the equivalent of one of those posed newborn photos. The thing that a professional photographer captures after everyone's had a chance to get a little cleaned up and maybe had a bit of a night's sleep. I don't myself have any kids, but my understanding of labor from my mom and from my friends who have had children is that it is messy. It's often long and painful. It takes a lot of work to have a baby. It's sweaty and it's bloody and it's beautiful and it's holy. That's the nativity set I want for 2020. That's sort of the image I think I need in my mind this year because it captures an essential truth that Christ is born into messy, troubled, bloody, sweaty, difficult, beautiful reality. That's what it really is to be human. Emmanuel, this Jesus comes to us with cries of pain and cries of wonder, with pangs of labor and pangs of love. The carol that me and my dad sang this evening, A Little Town of Bethlehem, has this beautiful lyric. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Those lyrics feel so fitting because this year has been full of fear. The fear of getting sick, the fear of getting your loved ones sick, the fear of a nation divided, the fear of losing a job, the fear of white supremacy and everywhere that it lurks, the fear of being alone, the fear of death. And this year has been full of hope if we've been able to train our eyes to it. The hope of a vaccine, the hope of new and just leadership, the hope of Black Lives Matter, the hope of connection, the hope of solidarity, the hope of rest, the hope of recovery, the hope of God, the hopes and the fears of this year are met in thee tonight, O oh Jesus. We bring to this manger our weary bodies and our beat up hearts. And we can be confident 
that God meets us there. Because the very shape of Jesus's birth, the very story of it shows us that Jesus breaks through difficulty, breaks through despair and brings forth light. There is nothing picture perfect about this year. Not one thing. That's okay. Maybe it's even a good thing that it's not perfect, that we're not pretending that it's perfect. Maybe it's even an opportunity. An opportunity to this evening fill in the gaps of our nativity sets and a chance to be reminded that for centuries on this evening, Christians have brought their hopes and their fears and themselves in the midst of good years, in the midst of hard years, have brought it all to Jesus. A chance to know once again, that Emmanuel is here. And so, of course, to demonstrate that, to symbolize it, as we have on Christmas Eves for years and years, we signify that Emmanuel is with us by lighting a candle, the Christ candle. If you have a candle in your house, any sort of candle, I invite you to go get it. It's okay, you can step away from the computer for a moment, go get a candle. So that we can light them together. 